Good evening, and thank you for joining us for Beyond Hope, exploring the lack of comprehensive need-based aid in Georgia. My name is Erin Robinson, Director of Outreach and Strategic Campaigns at the Georgia Budget and Policy Institute. Before I pass the mic to our moderator, I'd like to take a moment to thank the partners who helped us plan this event. They are Higher Foundation, Achieve Atlanta, and Georgians for College Affordability. Thank you all for your ideas that shaped our webinar tonight and your tire tireless work in post-secondary access. With that said, I'd like to turn it over to our moderator for the evening, Ashley Young, Policy Analyst for Higher Education at the Georgia Budget and Policy Institute. Take it away, Ashley. Thank you so much, Erin, and greetings. I am so excited to be your moderator for tonight's program. It is such a great day to talk need-based aid in Georgia. Again, my name is Ashley Young, Education Policy Analyst at Georgia Budget and Policy Institute. And before I get started, I just wanna give a quick shout out to one of my former students, Chloe Canada, who is now a college access educator. I would like to think that she's following in my footsteps, but uh, much love to you, sweetie, and thank you so much for joining the profession. So as we settle into tonight's conversation, I want to quickly begin with my positionality to the work. Um, I stumbled into my purpose as a college access educator when I was still an undergraduate student. I got my start providing college prep presentations to middle and high school students from Gear Up and Upward Bound programs. And for the last 15 years, I have witnessed the post-secondary landscape um, endure a host of challenges from budget cuts to the Great Recession of 2007, uh, to the rising costs of college and now to the end of affirmative action and college admissions. Amidst these setbacks, the one constant that truly has remained are the counselors, the educators and the public servants who have worked tirelessly to support students and families in their college journey. College access educators are also tasked with ensuring that students are informed about college attendance, um, cost of attendance, excuse me, financial aid options, and that they select the best financial fit. Without this support, many students like myself as a rural first-generation college student would not have been able to access college and to secure the funding to do so. But what is unique about our panelists is that they are doing this work in Georgia, which is only one of two states that unfortunately does not offer comprehensive need-based financial aid. So before we dive into the conversation tonight, it is important to understand this context within the state of Georgia. Of course, we are well known for our robust merit-based program, the HOPE Scholarship. And for any unfamiliar, the merit-based aid or merit-based aid in general is financial aid offered in recognition of student achievement. Now, on the other hand, need-based aid, like the name implies, is offered on the basis of a student's financial need. Both are helpful to support students in meeting their post-secondary ambitions, but the important difference is that merit-based aid can help students choose where they want to go to college, uh, mainly students who are already on track financially to attend college. Where merit-based aid can be helpful for some students, it does not typically improve the educational attain attainment for majority of our students in Georgia. As evidence, Georgia is ranked number three in the country for student loan debt per borrower, so it is clear that there is room for improvement. Need-based aid is about access. It is about helping students who have been financially marginalized get their, say, proverbial foot in the door to access post-secondary opportunities. As opposed to merit-based aid, need-based aid boosts educational attainment and helps to support students who are most financially and racially oppressed. And this reality has led us to tonight's focus. As we look forward to having a very thoughtful discussion about the urgency of equitable higher education policy in Georgia, and as the title indicates, we are moving beyond the understanding that merit-based financial aid is the only answer to our financial barriers by unpacking the critical role for comprehensive need-based aid in Georgia. So tonight's program features educators who have a broad array of experiences working with students from across the state of Georgia and helping them prepare for post-secondary education. And not only that, but to succeed in these endeavors through on-campus support. 
So without further ado, I will introduce our panelists. Lakisha Bonner, who is assistant principal at Griffin Region College and Career Academy. Nympha Morillo, who is senior director of scholarship and affordability at Achieve Atlanta. We also have Dr. Timothy Rennick, founding executive director of Georgia State University's National Institute for Student Success. And then lastly, we have Gabrielle Smallwood, who is a college advisor with the Georgia College Advising Corps. So thank you so much to all of our panelists who took the time out of their very busy schedule to be with us tonight. We are so happy to have you. So we will move forward starting with our questions. Uh, we're going to quickly go around for our panelists. And if you could please just provide us with a brief understanding of your current role. And I will start with Lakisha. So my um, current role, and actually I'm into my first month as assistant principal of Griffin Region um, College and Career Academy, but I am a former high school counselor um, in various school districts. So I've worked with students from different um, parts of Georgia as well as South Carolina. And I most recently have coordinated K through 12 school counseling. So um, that kind of gives you the background going into my new role of making sure students are ready for beginning with the end in mind and having the support to be able to do it is what need-based um, aid is needed for. Excellent, thank you. I will turn it over to Ninfa Morelia. Yeah, thank you. So happy to be here. Um, so as, I was as, as it was mentioned, my name is Ninfa Murillo. I'm the Senior Director of Scholarship and Affordability at Achieve Atlanta, which is a nonprofit organization that help specifically Atlanta public school students access, afford, and complete post-secondary credentials. Um, I currently, with my role there, oversee their need-based scholarship, which I believe is the largest need-based scholarship for, um, Georgia, for the students of Georgia. And um, I also lead the design and implementation of different affordability initiatives um, for the organization. Thank you, Ninfa. Um, Gabrielle Smallwood. Gabriel, good, good, good evening, everyone. I'm Gabriel Smallwood. Uh, I serve as a college advisor for the Georgia College Advising Corps, and I serve at Clark Central High School. So within my role, I help underrepresented uh, populations of students who might not have like the financial need or might not have necessarily the background to get into college. So necessarily my job is just being there, helping on one-on-one -on -one meetings for financial aid and just making sure that they have access to information and access to college. Excellent, Gabriel. Um, thank you so much. And last but certainly not least, Dr. Timothy Rennick. Yeah, good evening. I, I'm Tim Rennick. I'm currently executive director of the National Institute for Student Success. For 13 years, I led the student success efforts at Georgia State University, where we were able to raise our graduation rates by about 70%, but maybe more noteworthy, eliminate equity gaps based on race, ethnicity, and income level. We've had about seven years in a row now where our Black, our Hispanic, and our Pell eligible students have graduated at or above the rate of the student body overall. And uh, two years ago, I pivoted to be the director of this new institute. We're helping right now more than 50 colleges and universities nationally implement evidence-based approaches to both improving graduation rates and reducing equity gaps through data and technology, and uh, 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 in some cases, uh, data-based financial aid programs. Awesome. So as you can hear, our panelists have um, lots of experience supporting students, and I believe it will make for a very rich conversation tonight. Um, so we want to first begin by framing the issue. So a few of the questions that I'm going to ask in just a moment are going to do just that. Again, tonight is about informing you all and understanding how we can move beyond this idea that merit-based scholarship um, is, is the best or only way to help students. So we really want to put emphasis on that. So we're going to frame um, what that looks like. Um, so anyone can jump in from our, pa our panelists. And our first question is, in framing the issue, Issue. Can you please speak to the urgency of need-based aid, one, and how this urgency has given impetus to you agreeing, agreeing to serve on the panel? I'd be happy to start off on that. Um, 
before I pivoted to doing student success work at Georgia State, I was a faculty member for 15 years and got to see firsthand a very disturbing dichotomy that we would have students that were equally talented, some of whom would graduate and some of whom would drop out with no degree and often with debt. And the distinction wasn't drive, determination, ability. It was really, in many cases, uh, the financial resources. And in my role uh, currently as director of the National Institute for Student Success, we've recently run a longitudinal study. We looked at 75,000 uh, bachelor's degree seeking students. And what we found was really disturbing. We asked, what was the difference in graduation rates between students among those 75,000 who never had to stop out for financial reasons for even a single semester, never had a financial hold preventing them from enrolling, never got dropped from their classes because they uh, couldn't pay their tuition and fee bills versus what were the graduation rates for those students who even for a single semester had that problem. And across 75,000 students, across eight years of the longitudinal data set, the graduation rate for the students who never had uh, to stop out for a financial reason was over 70%. The graduation rate for students who had to stop out for even a single semester was under 25%. So you're talking about a 45 to 50 percentage point difference in graduation rates based on that one in, uh, indicator that in most cases is beyond the student's control. And we need to do better as a community, as a state, and as a society to serve these students. I'll jump in right after. Um, so we at Achieve Atlanta really believe that post-secondary credentials and degrees drive social mobility. And so uh, when the organization was founded, we knew that one of the strategies that we had to do was help students afford college um, to be able to access you know, education. To, to, so to highlight the urgency, some of the things that we have found um, now that the organization has done its work since 2016. Um, we've been collecting some data on our student experiences and including a survey that looks at a representative sample of our students. And what we have found is that even with them um, receiving federal aid, um, state aid, and only about a third of our students receive HOPE, um, institutional aid, funding aid gaps remain. And the Achieve Atlanta Scholarship, which is a need-based scholarship, was really helped to kind of close the gap on that financial need that they had. But we are only serving one district in Georgia. So we could see the, the definite need that there is across the state. Um, one of the things is that we also know is that need-based aid is on the decline. And even with borrowing and all this aid, we hear from our college alumni that said, had I not had the Achieve Atlanta scholarship, this need-based scholarship, college would not have been affordable. So again, we're only serving one district in Georgia and we definitely see the need for this to be open to more students in Georgia. Thank you. And I echo everything that's been said so far. And just to add to that, I'll just take a little bit of a uh, conventional approach. I have this t-shirt here that was given to us on the first day of school. And it says on the front side, at the end of the day, and on the back side, it says, it's all about the kids. So the reason why I decided to come here and be on the panel today was to learn more so I can be able to inform my students more, so I can be more informed myself and also so I can be able to uh, advocate for my students too and just find out how, how we can approach this issue, what are some solutions to this issue so, so I can be more educated too for my students. So I can echo what Gabriel just said as a um, assistant principal working with students, especially students who are focused on their career development in the classes that they're taking, but um, supporting the school counselors as well, especially the school counselor at the school that I'm at, is helping kids to not let funding be a barrier to what ultimately um, the pathway they, they want to take to for the foundation for their future. And that can become very frustrating when they're limited um, options for some students, um, especially with merit aid, um, but also um, scholarships. It isn't easy. Um, you have to, I tell students, it's like picking up a second job. You've got to be diligent in that. 
And so oftentimes our students who would qualify for need base don't necessarily have the parent support in order to do it. So it is falls solely on the shoulders of that student and having a counselor who doesn't have um, a whole lot of other duties as assigned um, and have the opportunity to be able to assist students um, is one of the reasons why I'm on the panel because I need for people to understand that we are trying to help kids find um, opportunities and making sure that funding is an uh, issue. But it is very disheartening to see that we are one of two states that does not have merit aid, which could help our students. For sure, thank you all so much. And I think Lakisha, I'm just gonna kind of segue from one of your points. Um, quality counseling is so important. Um, we could have a totally different webinar on that particular topic of how counselors are stretched beyond um, anything that they could really do to, to fully help students, unfortunately. So yes, and all of this comes back to why we need need-based aid to help students um, in their, in their post-secondary um, journeys. Thank you so much. Um, we're gonna move to our next question, our next framing questions. When students learn that Georgia does not offer comprehensive need-based aid, what type of solutions do you discuss? Well, I'll speak to that because I'm probably um, the person on the panel, at least in my background, um, I don't do it as much in my, um, I won't be doing it as much in my current role. But one of the things that um, we encourage students to keep their grades up so that they can um, qualify for um, merit-based um, aid. Um, we, a lot of counselors have scholarship workshops and, and things to help students to be able to apply, um, helping them understand that it's not a one and done, you apply to one scholarship and hey, magically you have all um, the money that you need. Um, helping them to understand that it is a continuous diligent process in order to get the funding that is needed, helping them to explore other options as far as um, schooling that is more affordable. It may not necess necessarily be their first choice if funding is an issue, but is it more affordable if that's the direction that they wanna go into? So it can be the funding piece can very much for some students be an obstacle. Yes, I agree with everything that was said. And for sure, this is something that I do almost on a daily basis because I meet with up to 300 students throughout this, more than 300 students throughout the school year. And when I meet one-on-one -on -one with them, that's one of the things that we discuss is a fit for them in terms of finding the school. Is it financially a good fit for you? And then we look, we start looking at upside options too in terms of scholarships. I try to have as many scholarship workshops as I can. And we also have a rolling scholarship database that the counseling department team at my high school and I try to find scholarships and add them onto there. You've been hearing about some solutions directed to the students. I know from the list of attendees to this evening, a lot of my colleagues from the post-secondary sector. And when I talk about solutions, yes, we, we, we work with our students, but we also need to talk to institutions about doing a better job with the students who are entrusted to them. I'm happy to say at Georgia State, uh, despite the fact that nationally and statewide, the average debt load is going up, we've been able to reduce the average debt load for our graduating students each of the last six years. And currently it's about half the level of the state of Georgia average. And the way we've been able to do that is not enrolling better resource students. In fact, our numbers of low-income students have gone up over this time period, but doing a better job at serving these students to help them navigate what is often an atrociously complicated college bureaucracy more efficiently. And that does get to issues that Ashley mentioned about counseling and academic advising and program mapping and proactive outreach and so forth. But what we've been able to do in recent years is reduce the average time to degree for an average graduate of Georgia State by almost a full semester, not by eliminating graduation requirements, but by doing our job better as administrators in helping students get through their requirements efficiently. And if you want to know the dollar amount, what that equals uh, from the pockets of the students, that's saving students about $21 million a year. 
So although, although the state hasn't stepped up and necessarily offered that kind of need-based aid, that by being better institutions and helping our students uh, uh, more holistically, we can uh, reduce the, the, the load that's placed upon them. And so all of the, those post-secondary colleagues who are on this call today, you know, this is a call to action and it's, it's basically the mission of the NIST that I direct to work with these institutions to make sure they are serving their students better. Yeah, and, call, and building off of um, Dr. Renick's thread there, um, we also see that financial literacy continues to be a big need in this space. And very often, you know, students are not even aware of the difference between need-based aid and merit-based aid. And if they do, it may be very late in the process. There's these kind of very limited windows and very limited face time um, that those working with students may have to make some very, you know, tough life-changing decisions at times. And so definitely being able to provide a more comprehensive, more support to our counselors on the ground and advisors and more information available to our students and families is definitely a continued need. Um, yeah. So that's, so building on that, I, I completely agree with everything that's been said. And just to add to that point, which I think is an excellent one, we, you know, we, we enroll uh, at Georgia State, about 80% of our students are non-white and about 60% of them are low income. Uh, we have to realize how limited uh, the understanding of this complex financial uh, uh, segment is. And we've had students come in not even understanding the distinction between grants and loans and passing up grant money, which of course they will never have to pay back. By its very nature, and saying, "Oh, well, I can get this, uh, you know, this amount from loan, and it's easier to do it that way." So the level of literacy is is certainly a concern uh, when we're dealing with tens of thousands of students who, in many cases, are the first in their family to go to college, don't have parents or brothers and sisters or aunts and uncles who can guide them through this process. And it's another area where we, as a sector, need to do a much better job in educating uh, our students. Wow, I'm over here giving chills, folks. I love that energy, Dr. Rennick. And from all of our panelists, when I think about a call to action from a person in your role um, at such an inclusive and hardworking university to make sure that we're not just graduating students um, in a timely fashion who have the resources, we're graduating students. If we admit them, we want to make sure that they persist and graduate. And that is so important. And we know that when institutions are not putting in that support, that it can create disparities in graduation and persistence rates. So thank you all so much. Um, this is already rich and filling my soul. Thank you. Um, so let's keep moving on. So how could students who qualify for HOPE also benefit from need-based aid? Yes, so this is uh, this is something that I usually talk to my students about as much as possible because college is not only just tuition. It's also a cost of attendance. So you gotta find a way to pay for books. You gotta find a way to pay for food when you're in college, where you're gonna live. So all of those things are also factors to put into account, to keep into account. So I always tell my students in terms of picking the school, we have to add those factors in there too. So just like coming back to all this, I would say if we had need based aid added to that, that will also help cut down on the amount that they have to worry about just for total cost of attendance. Cause college is not just tuition. And I always try to echo that, but not every school in Georgia have a college advisor. So not every school in Georgia, not every student in Georgia will get this memo. Like we say, a lot of the students that we do serve first generation. So they're not hearing this most of the time from their parents or guardians. So it is a really, really tough situation. And one other thing and I would add um, that we're hearing is, so not all of our students receive um, the HOPE uh, scholarship. And those that even do, we're hearing there is a large percentage of students that come back their second year without that aid and leaving that financial gap again. Um, so they're not, you know, they don't meet the renewal requirements and, and um, will now have a gap, you know, going into their second year. So definitely another opportunity you know, for need-based aid there. And, and just to highlight the, the nature of this gap, at Georgia State, the full cost of attendance, and this is a number that's established in conjunction with the federal government. So what does it cost for a full-time student to pay for tuition and fees, but for housing and for food and for books and so forth is well over $20,000 a year. 
Tuition and fee is less than half of that. So especially with recent inflation, we have to recognize you can have a student on a full ride in the sense that they get their tuition and fees covered. And like uh, NIMFA is saying at Georgia State, that's not the majority of our students. The majority of our students don't have the HOPE scholarship and don't come in with tuition and fee covered. But even if they do, they still have more than 50% of their costs to cover by other means. About 70% of our students this fall will have what we call unmet need, meaning that even after we package them, if they have HOPE, the HOPE scholarship, they have loans, all the things that we can pull together, they're, they're total package does not reach the full cost of attendance, which means they either have to borrow more than is appropriate, or they have to work more than 10 hours, even though they're full, full-time students. And that's what more often than not happens. And this then slows time to degree and adds further to the cost of education as students try working 30 or 40 hours while they're full-time students and uh, you know, end up inevitably uh, letting some of the studies suffer. So, um... I do a scholarship workshop with students. Um, it's with NACAC, the Association for um, College Admission Counselors every year. I see some people that I've, I've worked with um, on the call. And one thing that I say to them is understanding exactly what hope covers. It is great that you have hope, but what do you still have left to do? What are you expecting somebody to pull out a checkbook to write to cover the rest of your fees? And that is the piece that a lot of people think, oh, I have hope or I have Zell Miller, um, especially now that they both are awarding the same. Um, but what is left to be covered? And education, I feel, is the most important thing in helping parents and students understand exactly what hope covers and what are your solutions? Yes, you can do scholarship. Yes, go to the colleges and making sure you don't miss the deadlines to qualify for the aid that they um, have in place. But helping students who would who would qualify for dean based aid, often they do not have the same level of support. Often they are not the ones coming to my sessions. Um, so we need to make sure that we're doing more to help the students who don't have the support to with the, some of the solutions we're even talking about. Excellent. Yes, I think what I'm hearing from our panelists is that not only if a student is awarded hope, is it not going to um, really be sufficient? What if a student loses their HOPE scholarship? That happens pretty often. And so these are some things that we really need to focus on as we think about our case for need-based aid, as we advocate for need-based aid. Um, I was even chatting with Aaron Robinson as we prepare for tonight. Even if you are not even thinking about the criticality of the difference of say merit-based and a need-based aid scholarship, the the proof is in the pudding, right? So that kind of segues us into our next question. We are number three. Georgia ranks number three for student loan debt per borrower. Um, this is this is not a good um, statistic, right? So as we think about this, right, we're we're just behind um, Washington D.C. as first, and then Maryland. Why is this stat important in the discourse of advocating for comprehensive need-based aid? Again, these kind of tie to um, back to our title and the focus, but why really is us ranking number three as a state for student loan debt per borrower important as we advocate and think about uh, comprehensive need-based aid? Um, beginning with the end in mind, how long is it gonna take you to pay that debt off? Um, and how imp how does that impact a student's future still having to pay student loans um and they're already um at somewhat of a disadvantage so for me what that says to me is that we are not giving our students a competitive edge we're not setting them up with the best foundation that they can have for their future um especially if they're relying on loans in order to pay for their college. Um, something that Dr. Rennick said earlier about um, it being easier. And oftentimes it is easier to sign off on that, that um, promissory, you know, I qualify for these loans. 
but is that financially the best option for students? And that's where I think education comes and students having access to the people who can really talk about that. And I think the, the stat that you're citing, Ashley, that Georgia is number three in this ranking where we don't want to rank high in uh, uh, average loan debt is in part a product of the HOPE scholarship, which I love in many ways. But the reality is a great number of students uh, who get the HOPE scholarship lose it because they don't maintain a 3.0 GPA. And what's happening in Georgia is because we've invested so much of our resources in the HOPE scholarship, a merit scholarship, it is acting like a, a need-based scholarship for many students as they enter college because it's the only way they have access to college. If you're low income and you get the HOPE scholarship, you can get into college. But it's very easy for a first-year student after the first two semesters to have below a 3.0 GPA. We're talking about, in many cases, first-generation college students, low-income college students, and so forth. We should be celebrating the fact that they finished their first year of college with a 2.9 GPA. But what we're doing instead is saying, sorry, you don't make the cut. And what we were covering before, now full uh, you know, tuition costs, we're going to cover zero of that. And good luck staying enrolled. Well, most of these low-income students don't stay enrolled. In fact, we have the data to support it, not just at Georgia State, but the other campuses we're working with. The graduation rates between the students who come in on hope and hold on to it, and the graduation rates for those who come in with hope and lose it is about 40 percentage points lower for the, the, the students who lose the HOPE scholarship. They're not academically less qualified. They Both groups came into college with at least a 3.0 high school GPA to qualify for the HOPE scholarship. We should be celebrating these students in many cases, but because it's a merit-based scholarship and not a need-based scholarship, what we're saying to large, really thousands of these students every semester is that's not good enough. Even though you did B work or very close, that's not good enough, uh, and you may well have to lose your college dream because of it. And what we're also seeing in terms of the details of that borrowing is that there are higher levels of borrowing of debt among Black students and low-income students as well. So I think that's important to note. And even with borrowing, um, so even if they're having to borrow, they still are sometimes facing gaps. So I think for freshmen, the, the, the ceiling is like 5,500, right, with the sub and unsub um, together. And so they're needing to borrow that plus still have a gap and still may need to work or still may not be able to afford. Um, so that's definitely a grim picture. For sure. Thank you all. And I just want to uh, quickly note that there is uh, $1.9 billion in our education lottery reserve. That's B as in bad, <laughs> as I like to say, $1.9 billion. And, and of that $1.1 billion, um, are unrestricted. So it is clear why we really, really want to get the word out. And we're having these types of discussions to really help Georgians know that the money is there. We just really want to uh, place a call to action to everyone to help encourage our legislators to really take action. So thank you all for that. And I do want to say again to our attendees, if you have questions, we'll be taking questions in just a few minutes. Um, please place those in our Q&A uh, feature. We will get to those or as many as possible that we can within the hour. Thank you so much. We're going to move a little bit to um, more direct questions to our panelists. So for Gabe and Lakisha, Based on your roles, can you tell us more about your experience counseling students and how a state-sponsored need-based aid um, could have made a difference for the students that you've worked with? So telling us some of those counter stories, hearing about some of those um, on the ground sort of lived experiences that you all have, we're, we're curious to learn more about how a state-sponsored need-based aid grant could have helped those students. Yes, so I would say for me, definitely the first thing I try to do is to make sure I'm not trying to kill a student dream because students do come in with big dreams. You don't want to tell them, no, this is not possible right away because you still want them to, you know, you want to understand where they're coming from and then try to meet them where they're at. So what I usually try to do is, again, go back to scholarships, try to pivot back to scholarships and helping them also understand that there are other options in terms of other schools they can also look at. So they can still go ahead and 
have that open as an option, but understand that should not be that only option. That's where uh, building a balanced college list come into play because you can always have another option just in case. But sometimes it gets, there's still that financial need. So I make sure I try to communicate that with my students as much as possible. And I agree. Um, providing as many opportunities to help support students um, to educate themselves, educate themselves the pros and cons of taking out the loan, educate themselves on making sure that they're completing their FAFSA in, in a way to get, you know, um, what they need as far as federal payer grants and and just trying to truly educate students, but also be there to support them in applying for scholarships. And because at this point, um, the frustration that comes, and it kind of goes what Gabriel just said, no counselor wants to be a green, dream crusher. Um, and, but it is important to help students understand how much this school is gonna cost you. and and weighing the pros and cons and what are some other options that may be um, a viable choice. It may not be your, your top priority, um, but a viable choice for you to be able to pursue and not necessarily come out in debt um, or have to struggle. Because of a lot of our kids who need need base and would um, qualify or be eligible for need base also work. Um, that's one of the reasons why some of those GPAs um, take a take a dip, because making that transition to um, college, not having as much as the support that they get when they were in high school, is why we see some of those changes. Because they are carrying jobs and um, other household responsibilities, um, but also oftentimes they're first generation, so they are carrying the weight of being able to carry and, and make families proud that they have succeeded. Um, and so that's helping them to understand in order to make that, they may have to choose something different. And sometimes that is hard. Absolutely, thank you so much. I know it can be such a journey um, with students and parents as you're trying to figure out that next step and navigate around the financial barriers. So thank you so much for the work that you all do. Um, I'm going to transition over to NINFA. Um, as you mentioned, Achieve Atlanta offers the state's largest need-based aid program. Can you tell us more about how this works and all of the great outcomes that you all have so far? Yeah, so um, our programs, we started serving students in 2016. Um, we provide a need-based scholarship for students that have been part of APS for the last two years in high school. Um, and we, the, the need-based data, how we assess need is uh, having them complete the FAFSA and looking at um, the FAFSA submission summary, it used to be the student aid report, now will be the FAFSA submission summary, um, and looking at an index to, to determine their need. Um, again, everything is changing. So it kind of emphasizes the point of financial literacy because this year we'll be going through a transition where there's gonna be a new student aid index. So students in that are seniors right now will qualify for our scholarship if they have a new student aid index of negative 1500 all the way up to 15,000. And so if they fall within that range, um, they would be eligible for our scholarship in a minimum of 75 GPA, about 2.0. So we, we right now, since 2016, we've been serving about one third of all graduating seniors from Atlanta public schools. 94% of our students are Black or Latinx. 97% have been eligible for the Pell Grant. Um, over 70% um, had an EFC of, of zero. Um, that's the old kind of index that, that was used previously that's shifting to the student aid index that I mentioned. Um, by the way, we're going to be all kinds of campaigns going on this year to, to help with the shift. Um, and what has that yielded? So we've really looked at providing this need-based aid um, and looking at our, four, our first two cohorts, which would have so, you know, enough data for us to look at the performance, our 2016 and 2017 cohort. They're earning degrees at rates similar to students at all income levels. So we've closed that gap on attainment levels between low-income students and affluent gaps in the state of and affluent students in the state of Georgia. 
They're graduating with less debt, many times well below the state average. So again, with that model of saying, what can need-based aid do? We have seen so much promise. And again, we're just doing this in one district in Georgia, and would love to see this type of opportunity available to all of our students in Georgia. Excellent. Yes. Thank you so much, Nifa, for the information. It's so critical, especially for um, a district like Atlanta Public Schools. Thank you. I am going to transition to our last um, directed question to Dr. Rennick. Um, in my research, I come across a lot of historical work that you've put into establishing completion grants, not only at Georgia State, but now making this a uh, this resource a national model. What would you say is the most significant benefit and what is a drawback of completion grants as it relates to student success? Yeah, so uh, about 10 years ago at Georgia State, we were losing over a thousand students every single semester who were qualified and registered for their classes, but couldn't come up with the cost of their tuition and fees. And state law in Georgia requires that we, in effect, drop these students from the registration roll. Heartbreaking. These are successful stories academically. They want to be enrolled. They're eligible to be enrolled. And we're losing them because they can't pay their bills. So we looked more closely at these thousand students. And what we found was interesting. The most surprising thing we found is the largest subgroup within the thousand were seniors, students who by definition were within a semester or two of completing their, their college degrees. And when we looked at that data more closely, what we found is because so many of our students are low income and so many of our students are working, it was taking them longer than four years to graduate and they were running out of eligibility for their aid programs. They could be really good students, B averages, A averages, making good progress, but because a lot of the eligibility programs, including the HOPE Scholarship, basically covers four years, they were running out of eligibility short of the finish line. So in 2011, we started a program which requires no application from the students. One of my pet peeves is asking students to jump through bureaucratic hoops that they don't need to jump through. We know which students were dropping because they can't pay us the tuition and fees. We're the ones that are dropping them. We also know which students are close to graduating and which students have exhausted their eligibility for other aid, like the HOPE Scholarship or their Pell Grants. And what we started doing is putting the money in the student's account. If the student was close to graduating, owed under, and the initial uh, term was $1,500, now it's $2,500, and uh, had run out of eligibility for their other aid programs. And what we found is by keeping the momentum going, those students enrolled instead of having them stop out, we were able to reverse very negative graduation patterns. The students who were stopping out, even if they were seniors, only about 30% of them were ever coming back to finish their degrees. Once we began giving these micro grants to keep the students enrolled through graduation, their graduation rates went up to 85%. How much was the average grant? $900. All it took was $900 to take a subset of students who were graduating at about a 30% rate and move that number above 85%. I'm very pleased to say that in 2022, the state of Georgia launched a parallel program. It's called the Georgia College Completion Grant Program. It's not large enough yet. There's not enough money in it. Some of that $1.8 billion you were citing a minute ago, Ashley, we would love to see more of it go to that fund but at least for students who in college have 80 credit hours or more and are making good academic progress, but running out of aid, uh, other sorts of eligibility, there is now this $2,500 grant that students can get both at private and public institutions, technical college and university system schools across the state of Georgia. And as you mentioned, uh, among the institutions we're working with through the NIST, through my institute, there are dozens of schools that are implementing the, these programs. One last comment about how important these database aid programs can be. The average grant that we've given over 10 years, we've given over 20,000 of these grants out at Georgia State alone over the last 10 years. The average grant is $900. We recently ran a study with an independent evaluator who showed the average debt load for a student who gets one of those $900 grants as they graduate is $3,700 less. 
So by helping the students graduate more efficiently, you're also helping them save a lot of money because otherwise, even the ones who do graduate are going to be bouncing back and in and maybe taking a course and then stopping out again and so forth. So we can do the right thing by students for a relatively modest amount of money and save the students significant amount of debt in the process. Excellent. We love to see it. Um, again, folks, we're asking that you uh, put your questions in the Q&A feature there. We will be taking those in just a moment because we are on our very last question for our panelists um, that we have prepared. So um, if you are if you were speaking to a lawmaker, to a policymaker here in Georgia and charged with advocating for need based aid, what simply would you say to them? All students in Georgia need access to social mobility and post-secondary education can be that, but we need need-based aid to access post for all students to be able to access post-secondary education. Our current financial aid system is not, does not have enough to cover the true cost of college and having statewide support for all Georgia students would be a tremendous help for their future, but also for the workforce needs of Georgia in the future as well. It's a win for all. It's an investment that's a win for everybody. And on that point, I will add that how short, short sighted it is for us to uh, cut corners when it comes to need based aid. Because my argument, and I have made it to some state legislators, is that we invest in many of the students from pre K all the way through. Uh, K through 12, and through the initial years of college, uh, the state of Georgia is putting resources into the education. We all know by every estimate uh, of the job uh, needs over the next decade or so, we need far more college graduates. But when it comes to these students, like the ones I was just mentioning, who are in their senior year and running out of their HOPE eligibility, we're going to turn off the spigot and say, yes, we've supported you for the last 20 plus years, but sorry, you know, you're not going to get that last $900, that last uh, $2,000 you need to not only cross the finish line to your benefit, but to benefit the economy of the state of Georgia as well. So I think being kind of What's the expression? Uh, uh, penny wise and pound foolish. And that's what I think Georgia does uh, currently, that we are not uh, making a sensible decision about uh, the investment as a state we've already put in these students and what it requires to get them across the finish line. So I wrote out my answer because what I've learned is when you talk to legislators, you've got to have go right to the point. I can get really passionate. So. A state-sponsored need-based grant can make a significant dis difference for students by enhancing their access to education, reducing their financial stress, improving academic performance and retention rates, promoting equity, um, equal opportunity, um, opening up better career aspects or prospects, and contributing to social mobility. It will help create a more inclusive, an educated society that benefits both individuals and the community at large. Nice, nice. Thank you so much. Um, you're right. I too get really passionate when I speak to um, our lawmakers and you do have to sometimes write those things down. Thank you so much. Um, we are going to now transition to some of our um, thoughtful questions that we have from our, our audience members. Um, we have several, and I'm super excited to dig into these questions. Um, so we are going to begin um, with our first question here. And that question is, all of our students are not going to college. Uh, what is the outlook for those students? So kind of switching it up a little, I know a, a big part of this conversation, of course, is post-secondary education, but for our students that are not going to college, what is the outlook? Can we uh, speak a little bit to that? Well, 
Well, one of the things that I have worked really hard to help, especially counselors to understand, um, to even improve their knowledge when it comes to career development. Um, we have done as, as secondary schools, a great job of trying to get kids into college. But um, the most expensive place that they can do career development is in college. And then we have those students who feel like that is not an option for them or they don't want to go or their career goals may not um, allow for college feeling almost less than. And so um, what I would say to those students who are not going is to really look at what are your career goals? How is that going to um, have you to be financially stable? Um, what kind of educational supports that you may be able to like, um, you look at technical colleges where they have the whole career grant, um, helping students to understand what are those high demand um, careers that are out there, especially where there may be some aid for them to get some um, support um, in building that skill level. But the other thing is while they're in high school, taking advantage of the 30 hours of dual enrollment. Um, so you're not planning to go on to college afterwards, but here may be an opportunity for you because dual enrollment is highly in most of our high schools. Um, those 30 hours are spent on um, uh, career development type classes, um, welding and um, CNNs. And so helping those students come away with that competitive edge to get even a career afterwards and have a skill set level that they don't have to go and get after they graduate. Yes, I definitely agree with everything that was just said just now. And I do tend to deal with some students who are undecided and I try to work with those students and meet them where they are at. And one of my favorite tools to use is the tools on Georgia Futures, it's called uh, We Are You Chuck Tool. So just the students can go on there do some questionnaire in terms of like how they want to live, like do they want to pay for that Netflix subscription? Do they want to have, what, where they want to live? And just go through and answer that and just see what kind of money they would need to make to be able to meet that needs, that, to meet those needs. So necessarily what I also pivot back to is to just have college open as an option for them, not necessarily just tell them that you have to go to college, but just have it as an option also. So I want I support my students in whatever they want to do. Like I said, I'm, don't try to kill their dreams. I, try to support them wherever they're at, but I also want to make sure that they understand that whatever goals that they have, they need to have plans, place, they need to have action behind those plans so they can be able to reach those goals. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, and I might have missed just sharing, and I might have missed just sharing. Um, um, our scholarship is also available to, um, to be able to pay for certificates and technical degrees and um, yes, yeah, so post-secondary credentials in general. Ninfa, let me just say that is such a, an important, um, inclusive piece of Achieve Atlanta. I think we take for granted um, in, in a lot of cases, quite honestly, um, that students will maybe go to a four-year or two-year, but those credential programs that students are, are getting, um, you know, accelerated opportunities to jump into the career is just the best fit for them. And that's excellent. And I think that that is so important. Um, thank you so much. Our next question is uh, from Taylor Ramsey. She says, how have similarly situated states made need-based aid happen? How have they generated the political will or funding? Yeah, the, it, it's it's two worlds out there when you look across the United States as far as need-based aid is concerned. We know this because we work with campuses in states, blue states like California, but even some red states like Indiana, where need-based aid is much more robust. And some of the programs that are so essential for Georgia, for instance, this completion grant program I was describing uh, just a few minutes ago, is it really necessary in California? It turns out that if a student's running out of money as a college student in California, there are other state ways to support that student to get them across the finish line. We work with, uh, with Purdue in Indiana. They didn't really have need for these completion grants because again, there was a robust e uh, ecosystem around these students to support them. So Georgia is an outlier as far as some of these problems are concerned. We're far from unique, 
There are problems, uh, chronic problems nationally with regard to uh, uh, under resources for getting students through college. The Pell Grant has not, for instance, kept pace anywhere near pace with inflation. When it was first founded in the 60s, it covered most of tuition. Now it covers a small fraction of, of average tuition costs and so forth. But it is true that there are a number of states that have recognized that this is a really good investment, not just for individuals, but it's a good investment for the state as well. And one detail I'll just cite here is uh, the most recent uh, uh, data from the Pell, uh, uh, excuse me, from the Pew Research Center says that the difference in lifetime earnings for a bachelor's graduate versus an individual who just has a high school diploma, on average, and there are exceptions, there are bachelor's students who don't succeed uh, economically and so forth, but on average, is between 900,000 and a million. So every student that we can get to cross the finish line is earning about 900 to a million dollars off the over the course of their career. So again, you know, putting a few more hundred dollars into need-based aid or at most a few more thousand dollars in need-based aid can pay back to the states uh, by hundreds of thousands of dollars in tax revenues and so forth over the lifetime of the individual. Thank you. And just a quick follow-up, Dr. Rennie, you had a um, question in the chat and um, an audience uh, uh, member wants to know, is the completion grant available at two-year community, oh, excuse me, two-year schools or community colleges? Yes, I, I believe it is. You can Google completion, uh, Georgia College completion grant and get all the eligibility requirements, but two-year institutions, to my knowledge, are, are, are able to award the completion grant as well. Yeah, I can confirm that two year. So um, colleges in the technical college system of Georgia, university system of Georgia, and also private institutions. Excellent. So we want to squeeze in two more questions because you all are asking amazing questions. So if our panelists can just keep um, these next two questions, the answers to them just as brief as possible. So we have a, a quick question. It says, I've noticed that many students assume that scholarships are mostly merit based. They'll usually come up with concerns um, that their GPA isn't high enough to apply for any, so they don't try. What language can we use to help dismantle that belief among students and help them understand how inclusive aid can be? Well, I'll jump on that. Um, so when I talk about scholarships, I let students know that anybody who has money to give can offer a scholarship. Red hair, left hand, hand um, left-handed, right-handed, whatever they want to have as a criteria. So because of that, you've got to go through, um, take the time to go through in order. And there are a lot of scholarship um, search engines out there. Um, I can't think of his um, first name, but last name is Gray. Came up with one because he came up with, got a million dollars worth of scholarship, I think is um, scholarly. Um, and so people have those to help them to kind of put things about yourself. So most of the scholarships out there are not need-based, um, but it's taking the time. So helping students to understand. So the, the, the words I would use is there are scholarships out there for you that meet your need. Um, it's just taking the time to actually navigate it to find them. And that's what's disheartening and why need base I feel is needed. Excellent, thank you, Lakisha. Um, our very last question, Alexandra Thaxton, um, she says, what's the best thing we can do as tax paying citizens of Georgia to lobby for need based aid in our state with $1.9 billion? Let the legislator hear this concern. I mean, one of the reasons why hope just got re-upped to 100% is because politicians believe it's a very popular program and it will gain them votes. If they believe that the electorate wants to, and we should want more need-based aid, it's in our interest as a state, but it's also in the interest of our students and their families, then they will respond. And I think it's important to note that I think we have a legislator on this call today. So I hope he is taking what he is hearing back to the floor um, to be able to continue to advocate because I do think those committees and the voice and the influence 
um, we need to continue to be almost like the net in the air, um, planting the seeds. Um, and then encouraging our legislators with the biggest voice and the biggest influence to push those things forward. It is a matter for it to get pushed forward to be a priority. Excellent. Folks, this has been amazing. Thank you so much to our panelists, Gabe. Like you said at the beginning, it is all about the kids. Your work to support and provide students that you provide students is unmatched. I've seen the fruit of Georgia College Advising Corps. Please keep up the great work. Lakisha, what an amazing journey as a counselor coordinator and now building a building leader. Um, you will have such a profound impact on college and career outcomes. Thank you so much for your leadership. Ninfa, I cannot thank you enough and your colleagues at Achieve Atlanta. I used to get choked up when I would think about how much Achieve Atlanta scholarship would um, really encourage students in their journey. Your work is truly invaluable. And Dr. Rennick, wow, what an amazing research you all are conducting. The longitudinal st uh, study that you referenced earlier is so critical. Um, I'm not sure if you know this or not, but you're like the godfather of retention grants. Um, I see your name all the time cited. So we just appreciate you and all of our panelists being here. As we close, I want to leave you with one of my favorite quotes by Dr. Bettina Love. She says, abolitionist educators fight for children they will never meet or see because they are visionaries. That is who our panelists are, and that is who we are as an advocate community. I just want to reiterate that the establishment of need-based aid is largely dependent upon passionate and justice-oriented constituents like everyone on this webinar. Our panelists have shared their experiences and knowledge, and now it is time for us to take action. We want to continue the conversation about need-based aid and also um, acquire tips for advocacy. Lastly, we will pro provide practical financial aid resources for Georgia students and families in our takeaway toolkit. So with that, thank you so much for an amazing evening. I will turn it back over to Erin Robinson, our Director of Outreach, to tell you more about that and for closing remarks. Thank you so much, Ashley. We really appreciate everyone joining us tonight. Uh, early next week, you will receive the toolkit Ashley mentioned, which includes resources around the lack of comprehensive need-based aid information about how to advocate, as well as some resources shared by our panelists for financial aid and scholarships. And we will also share the recording of this webinar. Thank you so much for your time tonight, and thank you to our wonderful panelists. Have a good evening. <laughs>